was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switching bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor, while the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. Well, good morning, connecting the dots, listeners. It's Tuesday morning, August fourteenth, and we have a fantastic guest and a fantastic program today. And I have to uh, tell our listeners, it'll probably uh, some of you will be mad, some of you will be questioning, some of you will be uh, probably irritated in some of the subject matter that we're going to cover. But the fact is. We are here to educate and inform, and I happen to have one of the best educators in the country on board today as a guest, and that is Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet. And uh, Charlotte was a special advisor to uh, President Reagan. Uh, that was her assignment with the Department of Education to uh, talk about and to look at the education system in the country with the idea, at least she thought, of shutting down the federal agency, the Department of Education, and turning education back to the states and to the local communities where it really functioned much better. So uh, today with Charlotte on the show, we are going to be uh, attacking, let's say, or at least questioning some of the big organizations who claim to be conservative but uh, a lot of times do things that are antithetical to what we consider the constitutional Republican form of government. And uh, Charlotte's going to be talking about all the different things that led her to really begin to understand that our system is designed to, uh, let's say, implement socialism and communism in our school system, and it's been that way for a very, very long time. And um, uh, with that, I also want to uh, advise our listeners, uh, on the second hour, uh, I'm going to do something that I don't normally do, and that is we are going to be asking our listeners to call in and to question Charlotte on some of the areas that uh, she's going to be talking about. She relishes the opportunity to talk in great detail about some of the areas that, uh, quite frankly, uh, average Americans have no clue, and it's important that we get this word out so that people understand what we're up against, because the education of our youth is the most important thing for the future of our constitutional republic. And right now, the education system is not creating really uh, individuals and uh, people who are deductive reasoners. There is creating a system that is designed to promote collectivism. So uh, with that, uh, Charlotte, welcome to the show. And um, I, I can't tell you how much I always look forward to these conversations with you. I, I sort of laughed when you said your audience is going to, I don't, I don't blame them, you don't understand why. They're going to get pretty mad at me. And the, the thing is that ever since, certainly 1980, when I recognized the 
treason taking place at that point in time. It probably been before too. But ever since then, I've been very mad too. I've been mad for what? 20, 20, 38 years? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, folks in the audience, uh, I do feel sorry for you having to listen to me, but I don't feel anywhere near as sorry for you as I feel for myself. Because I've seen this happening to our great country and uh, our families and our children and our way of life and our Constitution. And uh, the last thing I ever wanted to believe was that there was a Trojan horse involved in this. And I, I was always going after the left, you know, fighting the Panama Canal and fighting the SALT treaties and, every, and education, of course. I was a local school board member in the 70s, fighting all that and getting in a lot of trouble myself right there on the school board. Um, I was very angry with the left. I was angry with teachers. I was angry with the NEA. I was angry with with the communists. I was uh, I was all on, you know. I, I became educated when I read Gary Allen's book, Not Your Call It Conspiracy. That helped me a lot. But so I just want you to know that your anger against me today is absolutely justified. But I'm really glad that you're not going to have to go through 30 years of being angry as I've been through. And I can assure you that everything that I have written or I'm going to say today or my written everything that I reconfigure is a wonderful website called deliberatecoming.com. It's a new website, and it has all my articles. Everything's listed very carefully, you know, the way good websites have, you know, about, and then at the end it says, interviews and it says articles and everything so I plead with you to go there because uh, a wonderful person activist in New Hampshire friend of mine, a public teacher by the way who's one of us 35 years in the trenches she offered to take all of my work ever since what ever since I got back to the United States in 1970 uh, and put it up there Everything. So, in a way, if you have questions, you can always go there too, and you'll find the documentation. So, with that said, I want to thank and thank for having the courage to have me on. <laughs> and I also want to Charlotte. Um, I, I, I don't mean to interrupt, but uh, I'm. I, it, it sounds like we're having a little bit of a, a problem with your phone uh, connection. It's kind of uh, uh, skipping in and out. Um, are you in on a uh, cell phone or are you on a landline? Because we we need to make sure that we have a good connection. You know, uh, hi, listening. Hi. Wait a minute. I'll t- I turn the, that thing off. Does that help? Yes, that does help. Okay, good. You see, I had you on speak, speaker sort of so I could hear it better. So now, is that better? Yes, that's much better. Thank you. All right, look. Uh, well, I hope that people understood what I was saying. That I, I understand they're being mad at me because I've been mad myself for what? How many years? I just said it. Uh, 40 years, right? <laughs> As I found out that the enemy was, of course, the left and the commies and all. But uh, I found out the real enemy is always, you know, if you go back, it was the Trojan horse, and it's the conservatives. Mm-hmm. And so, anyway, but that said, I want to not forget to recommend to everybody, what you've been doing anyway, Dan, the wonderful uh, Undersea production of uh, Revelation. Uh, the film. Oh, yes, yes, absolutely. Uh, Chuck and, and I, Anita, uh, the, their movie, that's how wonderful. Many years as I have, uh, I myself found information in there that I did not know. And I have listened to that thing four times. It takes Charlotte a long time sometimes to get it through her head. Huh? I have listened to it over and over. And I consider it to be the finest explanation, documentation of how our country has been taken down with hope for resurrecting it with God's help. 
and I hope that everybody listening in will take advantage of the uh, free showing, which uh, ends on the 3rd. But what, when does it start, Dan? I don't know. Yeah, I, uh, but I, I just recommend that people go to uh, their website anyway, uh, right. Revelation right. the Movie. Uh, that is really an excellent opportunity for people to find out more about that movie. Uh, there have been free showings. Uh, I believe the last one ended about a week ago, but then there will be more. They, uh, they've been continuing to uh, run these free showings, and what they're doing is they're trying to promote the sale of a three-DVD set which is many of the outtakes, many of uh, much of the other additional footage that wasn't on the original movie. And I'm telling you, folks, this is uh, one of the best things you could possibly support. Um, right, Charlotte? Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I I just can't believe what they've done. I, I, and I admire them so much because how many Americans are going to put everything you know they own really into you know none of us are none of us chickens have much money do we oh uh, it's all the big guys who are bringing us down that have the money mm -hmm. so i just thank i thank them i i hope god will bless them forever in the effort that they the work they've done to put that together for all of you listening to this interview and forward all of what Dan sends you in regard to their effort to everyone around the world because it really it deals people around the world I've lived around the world a lot what how am out of my life probably good 25 years I know that foreigners are waiting but they keep waiting for us to do something mm -hmm. well they're not happy with with the fact that we're not doing anything so it's terribly important that this film be made available uh, internationally as well. Mm -hmm. I agree. Well, uh, now, Charlotte, I want to I, I want to give you an opportunity to really talk about the things that are important to you. Yeah, I'm going and to. Um, I know this Trojan horse idea uh, is hugely important to you, but I would like you to maybe build a little bit of background so that you can kind of give a bit of the history of how we have uh, really created the, the monster that we've got right now as far as allowing things to happen that should never have happened. And uh, if I give you, um, you know, a, a format to do that, would you please just provide our listeners a little bit of a, a history and a background on how we got to where we are today? Well, yeah, what's the format you're going to give me? Well, the format is, is I'm going to ask you to kind of build on, you know, some of the things that you discovered uh, early right, on. I as my uh, best, but it's to go through how I got involved. Okay. Yeah. Let, let's start with well, that. Yeah, that's, that's my best bet. Uh, I'll do it quickly. Okay. It's the uh, 1952, I was a very patriotic young lady around 22 and I went abroad with the American Red Cross and served uh, with the military strategic air command in the streets. can you hear me Charlotte hello Charlotte Korea. hello Charlotte yeah Charlotte um, uh, we're having trouble with your phone connection again I'm not sure why all right well I'll just try to stay still and not move here all right, okay. So right I, now you're coming in great. Do you get it now? Yeah, it, you're you're coming in great right now. All so. right, I just won't move. <laughs> okay. Make sure I don't move. Not my toe. Not my finger. Not my. Well, we'll give you a break not, at the I, half hour and at the top of the hour, and then mouth. you can move. Anyway, <laughs> uh, I uh, I was there. I was stationed there, and then I I left. Uh, uh, I went back on a freighter, third class, and. Uh, a lot of this is on the internet, uh, in that Alex Jones that uh, he did obviously all but anyway, on the way back I was on a third class in a freighter and I ran into uh, Chinese and Vietnamese uh, refugees coming out of both of those communist countries. 
and we would talk, you know, for a month I was on board with them, and we talked for about a month, you know, at dinner, good food, French freighter, and a bottle of wine in the middle of the table, and we had good talks. I found out my eyes were opened, because I had been sort of brainwashed that Joseph McCarthy was uh, crazy and all this and that, and uh, uh, so I wasn't really sure. I I'd sort of been, I'd been wondering because it was a massive brainwash that took place back then. A few of the guys who came out there said, yes, McCarthy was correct that our government had been completely infiltrated by communists. And it had, and that was, of course, well, that started before 1945. I mean, I can go into that with the Carnegie Corporation and education. But anyway, uh, we had these conversations. And I woke up, arrived back, got back home. Then I uh, was at home in New Jersey. My dad, you know, he uh, really was upset when I went abroad when I was so young anyway, and with all these handsome guys, you know, at the air bases. And he thought, ooh. Uh, this could be a little risky, but anyway, I survived all that. And I got back, and then I was home a month, and he said to me, Char, aren't you, when are you going to move on? So I thought, okay, you know, he's right. So I moved on to the State Department, and then I was stationed, worked for ambassadors, Middle East, in the Middle East, Soviet Affairs, and Africa. I was stationed in Africa, South Africa, and in uh the work in Middle Eastern affairs, but working for the people. Um, Charlotte, I hate to say it, but we're running into those same um, those same phone problems. I'm not sure if it's just a bad uh, connection or um, uh, do you have. Uh, access to a uh, landline or uh, some way that we can improve the connection. This is this is not this is a landline. It is okay. Well, it's uh, it's really skipping. Uh, we're only getting about every third word or so. Uh, well, I don't know what to do, uh, Dan. Well, we'll we'll, uh, we'll keep working on this. If uh, if if uh, if it is a landline, it shouldn't be doing this. Maybe we just walk, uh, just com continue to talk through it. Well, I I'm, I'm trying not to move. I can't help it if I move my mouth. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's for sure. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So anyway, I I get back after that, and then I then I get married. I met my husband in Belgium, wonderful mm -hmm. person, very knowledgeable. He knew everything. I only found that out after about five years of marriage, that he knew everything that was in Gary Allen's book. And I said, why don't you tell me about that? He said, I thought you knew. Well, anyway, so we get married. We Then he, he's a great sailor. We had a older schooner. He bought it in Brittany, we fixed it up, he sailed it to the West Indies. We lived in Grenada in the West Indies where the, you know, the coup took place, horrible communist, Stalinist regime put in down there. That, that woke Charlotte up. I learned a lot about that one. I'd warned the Grenadians about that coming. I could see Stokely Carmichael coming in on his yacht into the harbor and all. I knew what was being planned for down there. So that was a big education for me, too, in communism. So anyway, then we come back. And we moved to Camden, Maine, because my husband is a yacht charter captain, and that was a business we had in the West Indies, too. And uh, we moved to Camden, Maine, which ultimately, in retrospect, I think was the pilot. I don't want to leave all my favorite people in Oregon and California and the state of Washington out in Philadelphia, but I do believe we were. Uh, we mm -hmm. were very close to the islands where you have the Watsons, IBM, you have all the old Rockefeller, Rockefeller, you have all the old families right off the coast of Camden. And so I saw, all of a sudden, we had a major change agent from Harvard came in, and I started complaining. And I was in big trouble, and you can find out all about this on the Internet. No way to avoid Charlotte's 
problems on the school board. Well, I was making so much noise, and I was being written up in the paper, bad pictures, of course, always. And uh, I got a call from a teacher, and I thought, uh-oh, here we go again. And she said, look, uh, I want to thank you <laughs> for the work you're doing on the school board. And I said, oh, well, what? Uh, do you agree with it? And she said, oh, absolutely. But I don't think you know what you're looking at. And I said, no, I don't. And she said, I want you to go for training. She said, I'll pay for it. And so she paid hundred dollars. That was a lot back then, nineteen seventy six. Me to go for training up in the himself, I was just a facilitator, a change agent, but he used this book called Innovations in Education, A Change Agent's Guide. And we were good teachers and all friends of mine, principal, etc. We're all in there, and we're being taught how to identify the resistors in our community. Well, I thought that was interesting because I was actually being taught how to identify myself because I was a resistor. And I remembered what the Chinese and Vietnamese uh, refugees had told me on the boat about how their grandfather had his hands cut off in China. He was resisting during the Cultural Revolution. And in Vietnam, the grandfather was resisting the Vietnamese, and uh, uh, he had his head cut off and uh, marched around town on a pole. Don't resist. So that was the beginning of Charlotte's education. Then I started Guardians of Education for Maine in the state. I started the only conservative group that's ever been in the state. It was shut down by the Heritage Foundation shortly after they got rid of all the good principles that we had in the 70s. All the people Okay, that will come later. But anyway, so then I go... Uh, you know, I go down to Washington, and I go into what is the number one office in the world, and I say that advisedly because the United States is the biggest country, most important in the world, and our U.S. Department of Education, which had become a department under Carter, was now considered a ministry, as are all the other uh, international, uh, the other countries in the world, were their ministries. So here I am sitting in the Office of Educational Research, which is key, the word, and improvement. And I see all the old documents from the former senior policy advisors, which I was a senior policy advisor, and, and, and all the new documents. But I see all their old documents because they were foolish enough to leave them there. These people, these individuals had been the president of Columbia, Harvard, Stanford, University of Chicago, these were the major change agents who were all their documents. I, they were all left in the cupboard. I found all of them. So then I, you know, I go through all of this stuff. I find out the horrible programs that are being put in, which now I've ultimately found out the conservatives were involved in as well. Very much so. Of course, school choice, charters without, on a, without elected boards. That goes all the way back to 1945, when the Chamber of Commerce agenda recommended vouchers. So people have to do their homework. They, all of this is on my website, in my books, right? By the way, I want to point out that the very people that kept you from knowing the truth about this, that's the Trojan horse. They shut down, they boycotted right. every single book I ever wrote, starting with Back to Basics Reform, or Skinnerian International Curriculum, uh, which was written after I was, uh, I got myself fired, right? I found that document in a grant going out uh, to the, all the different states regarding technology, which said on it, what we can control and manipulate at the local level. And it listed task force curriculum, everything that the feds could control at the local level. So that's why I leaked it, okay? 
But anyway, uh, so when I got out, I wrote back the basic reform. It's only 39 pages. Or Skinnerian International Curriculum. That's the computer with Skinner. Right? And that is a very important little book. It's only 39 pages. Uh, I called for getting rid of the U.S. Department of Ed on page 39, I think. I write Reagan, right? That book was initially boycotted by Eagle Forum. My good friend, I've known her for years, Phyllis Schlafly, and I, I will never understand how she was. I allow, I, I make excuses. I think terribly misled. All the way through to the time she passed away. Uh, the other groups, I don't have any feeling for whatsoever, but they boycotted that little book. They said that nobody would understand it. Well, the book is on my website. I gave you all delivered dumbing down. To find out what, what went on in the U.S. Department of Education under Ronald Reagan uh, with Secretary of Education Ted Bell, who was selected by Edwin Meese, who uh, I won't say what I think of him, but uh, it starts with a C. It's still over heritage. Okay. So anyway, I, I get my, there, I come out, I write that book, I figure, okay, well, it's boycotted completely. I really, the high wouldn't even let me sell it at a conference. She invited me down to, to speak at in New Jersey. Remember the okay, I have my little book there. I'll do a 700 pager, which is the deliberate dummy gun of America. Okay, well, we were lucky there that, uh, well, it did very well in the beginning, and then we realized the neocons, they, they found out about it, and then we decided to put it up on the internet free, haha, <laughs> as a PDF. And you can go there, it's a free PDF, you can read anything, the index is unbelievable. You can find out, you see all the original. Carnegie signed the agreement uh, to develop computer courseware for early elementary school children in critical thinking. When that happened, we all knew. Heritage Foundation supported the agreements with the Soviets. I believe set up an office in Moscow after the phony fall. And uh, did everything possible to boycott Charlotte. And uh, I was I was wiped off the face of the state of Maine when I really well it was probably from year 2000 on. Charlotte, uh, we're we're moving into a commercial break right now. If you'll hold that thought to the other side, go ahead and move around and and get an opportunity. You'll get a a few minutes here, and uh, we'll be back on the other side of the break. Serving the planet, the micro effect www.themicroeffect.com And we are, as a people, inherently and historically opposed to secret societies, to secret oaths, and to secret proceedings. For we are opposed around the world by a monolithic and ruthless conspiracy that relies primarily on covet means for expanding its sphere of influence. It was 1776 when the founders signed the writ of independence from the Brits. It was revolution. Now an enemy from within would enslave us all again and deprive us of our rights in the Constitution. Restore the Republic. Wake up, it's time to understand. Restore the Republic. We're losing our freedom in the land. 
Welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel, and today my guest on the radio show. From the daily news we read to the politicians, and they're pulling out financial strings, more powerful than kings. It's a central bank elite bringing our destruction. Restore the republic. Wake up, it's time to make a stand. Restore the republic. We are the people and we can Restore the Republic Pledge our allegiance to the flag Restore the Republic We gotta take the freedom back America, arise It's time to open up our eyes Welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Apple. Um, I'm, it sounds like we're having trouble getting the music off this, but uh, in any case... Uh, my guest today is Charlotte Iserbeet, and uh, Charlotte is a uh, really probably one of the cornerstone uh, people in the movement to take our uh, education system back to the founding basics and making us a country of uh, free education that is based on classical liberal education and not on the collectivist thinking of the uh, uh, jobs-to-work program, the permanent uh, uh, learning programs, and all these uh, UN-based ideas that are all based around collectivism. Uh, Charlotte, welcome back uh, to to the uh, discussion. Uh, We got a little bit of a chance to hear about how you got involved in this whole process from from the beginning. But what I would like uh, for you to do, and you, you started talking about the uh, Trojan horses that are really uh, part of the neocon, part of the uh, so-called conservative movement that are promoting a lot of the same ideas that uh, we're fighting from people who we think are on the, uh, on the far left. And so I, I think we're being... I think America's beginning to understand that we're being attacked from so many different directions, and every one of them will lose national sovereignty, will lose our individual rights, will lose our responsibility to uh, create individuals, which is the cornerstone of America. And uh, so with that, uh, we'll get back into the discussion and talking about the Trojan horse. Uh, Charlotte is not with us here at the moment. Dan, they're working on their problem there. They, they've they tried a couple of different phones there, so I expect her to call back in a second. Oh, okay. All right. Well, that's good. I, that's fine, and we will uh, we will be talking. I'd much rather have a good, uh, clear phone line in that way because she's got so much important stuff to tell Americans that uh, it's, it's really important that we have a good, clear connection. But um, anyway, what Charlotte is going to be talking about, and I'm certainly uh, experienced in this myself, is how uh, so much of our school systems now are being uh, utilized to train, uh, let's say, individuals to be collectivist thinkers, to, uh, to be uh, concerned more about uh, social justice and uh, different... Uh, uh, warm and fuzzy feeling uh, things than they are about actual education in the hard sciences, in mathematics and English, and the things that make us uh, better thinkers and certainly more competitive as a nation. Um, our understanding that we, we have some exceptionally in this country. And uh, one of the problems that we have with the... Uh, uh, the system the way it is, is that those exceptionally bright young people are being held back because of a system that is designed to seek a common ground on a much lower level uh, playing field than uh, some of these really exceptional people are capable of. And uh, frankly, any time you lower the common denominator to try to uh, make everybody the same, uh, the more likely you're going to have a bad outcome. And uh, I guess that's where we're at right now in this country, is that we've got a lot of 
uh, really exceptional young people who are incredibly bright, but uh, they are being held back by a system that is designed to um, deal with the lowest common denominator so that no one uh, no one feels bad, no one uh, doesn't get uh, a prize. And, and so um, that kind of a system is designed for failure from the very beginning, no question about it. Hey, hey, Diane? Um, oh, Charlotte, are you back on? Yeah, I am. I hope it's going to be all right. Uh, we, 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 uh, your, your guy, your, your tech guy there says it's all right. Yeah, it sounds great. Uh, we we were just kind of skipping in and out, and I, what you've got to say is so incredibly important. I want everybody to hear every single word. Yeah, well, I will try. Actually, probably what I said in the beginning wasn't the meat of the pro- pro- program, but they can always get all that stuff about my background. It's all over the internet, right? Especially yeah. Especially that yeah. Alex Jones one. Uh, what's it called? Miseducation of America. Or something. But all the video at my website, right? All of the uh, videos, YouTube's are listed of the key interviews, and all my articles, and you know, blah blah. I mean, I'm so mouthy, but anyway. Um, so maybe. Well, uh, be- Charlotte, I have to uh, let our listeners know too. I did put, uh, I copied and pasted all your links on the announcement letter that went out, but. I want you to give our uh, our listeners your websites before um, before you yeah. leave, so that we can make sure that they know how to uh, access right. your websites. Because well, some of the links that, that I put up did again, not work. Okay? Uh, yeah, it's, it's simple. It's three words all together: deliberate dumbing, D-U-M-B-I-N-G, down, D-O-W-N, dot com. Those three words all together. And it will pop up, and you will see my new con- reconfigured website that has everything, including Wikipedia, my background, biography, ev- everything is there. It's amazing what this gal, who's really been involved in, in web development for years, but a pub- as I said, a public school teacher, one of us, great patriot, 35 years in the classroom, she did this for me. Her name is Jane Aitken, by the way. I, why not give out mm. her name? Because she deserves yeah, yeah. credit. From New Hampshire. And um, anyway, so uh, I had moved on to the, I think I was discussing the, the, I have to give them credit. I don't know how they managed to do such an effective boycott of everything that Charlotte has written. Uh, we got around it by putting everything up free. Everything is free except for a few copies, and I, I think I'm going to buy them back myself because I don't have any left of the updated version. I have two copies left of the updated version of Deliberate Dumbing Down. The Big big Baby is, is the shorter version, updated, abridged, but really good. And the update itself is 19 pages in the front, and it discusses the thing that we are the most upset about that is going to take away our elective form of government. And that is, and I know your listeners probably don't want to hear this, and I don't blame them because uh, the public school system at this point is even ten times worse than it was when I was on the local school board. So they're going to be upset, you know, when I tell them that uh, the charter school initiative is very, very dangerous. In fact, it is more dangerous, and I'll tell you why, than the public schools, because the minute you go into a charter school, which does not have an elected school board, but is funded with tax money, you will not be able to complain about the Common Core you've been upset about, because you won't have an elected official to go to. So that is very key. Maybe I should repeat that. I told our governor, LePage, that two days before he was inaugurated, it was a short phone call because he had said he wanted to talk to me, right? Okay. And all right. So I, I explained to him, he said, what's wrong with charter schools? And I said, well, governor, look, if you go with charter schools, 
you're going to be right back where you are. And let me explain this to you. Charter schools do not have an elected school board, but they have federal funding, which means they are totally a million percent controlled in everything they do, say what? Food, pictures on the wall, everything. So they are identical to the public school system with one major exception. And that is you do not have an elected school board to whom you can complain. Mm -hmm. So then he says to me, oh, well, we'll have to do something about that. Oh, yeah, uh huh? Well, we had main heritages in here. They were running his show. So then was when I was absolutely wiped off the face of the earth, uh, Maine anyway. Steve Schran, a retired, but he's still working, music teacher in the public school system, a great American, he and I tried to inform people in Maine, but we couldn't. We couldn't get through because the heritage, Maine heritage had decided that, you know, in the Soviet Union they used to shoot you. Well, here they've got it really fine-tuned so that you just sort of disappear from the landscape. Here I was, the only person who ever found it or ran a really true conservative organization in the 70s in the state of Maine. We've never had one since. So they got rid of me. Nobody, nobody even knows who I am anymore. It's amazing. You know, it's actually, in a way, that would be nice if I weren't concerned about the country. So Heritage did that to us. Then later, you know, it was a horrible incident with my son being shot, two murder attempts. Uh, Sam tried to inform Heritage Foundation Maine at a luncheon they had in regard to the complete boycott across the country of, of the two murder attempts. Guy's still running around with a gun. He was never charged or arrested, and my son will never be the same. But anyway, Sam did manage to go to that meeting of Maine Heritage. And ultimately, you know, they got so upset. They didn't want to talk about it. Uh, Matt Gagnon, who is the director of Maine Heritage, uh, he said, well, 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 you know, maybe I think we better talk about this uh, somewhere else later down the line. You know, huh? Mm -hmm. And then the mm -hmm. audience said to my son, who is a, a, a combat Marine in Gulf War One, who was the one who got shot through the femoral artery, uh, with, in stage four hypovolemic shock, he was meant to be dead, right? They wanted him out because he has AmericanDeception.com website. Hmm? So anyway, uh, they tell him, shut up and sit down. Now that was allowed by Matt Gagnon, the head of the main heritage. Now, all your states out there, you have heritage affiliates. They don't all have the name Heritage, like Washington State is called Evergreen. And what I'm trying to tell you today, and I have the documentation up to Yin Yang, and I'm just going to, I'm going to ask you how, what you think here uh, about this uh, agenda of the Heritage Foundation. And I'm going to ask you what political label you would put on it. I'm not going to myself say. Mm -hmm. All right. In the late 70s, Heritage Foundation brought over, from England, of course, I love the work that Joan Vion did on that Revelation film about the UK's involvement in everything bad going on, mm -hmm. but brought over Stuart Butler, and he drafted, not Hillary was the first to draft socialized medicine. He did. His was the first draft for socialized medicine, Obamacare, right? He also drafted a paper for the need for enterprise zones. That's another socialist concept. Corporate fascist one, really. Then you have Richard Allen came over from the White House. Richard Allen was working as top dog under uh, Ronald Reagan. And he uh, got fired because the, he took a watch from the Japanese. But anyway, I think that prior to him working for Ronald Reagan, he wrote the North American Free Trade Agreement for Heritage, NAFTA, known as NAFTA. Mm -hmm. So what do we have there? We have socialized medicine, we have enterprise zones, and now we have NAFTA. Then we have Heritage, and this, this is direct quotes in my book, Deliberate Dumbing Down, a press release from Heritage. 
about Ronald Reagan signing the education and cultural agreements, which also include municipal exchanges, regional government, right, uh, with the Soviet Union in 1985. Heritage supported that. Then, in Maine, they held a meeting, uh, a conference, in regard to uh, consolidation. You still hear me there, Dan? Oh, yeah. Yep, I'm right. on. Mm -hmm. In regard to consolidation. And they brought in a professor from New Zealand in regard to the glories of consolidation. Well, having fought consol regionalism, that is, which is communism, having right. fought that for years in the 70s, I was really shocked. Even, you know, a professor at the University of Maine even agreed with me. He was on the podium when I complained. I said, what is this? What are you doing? Regionalism is communism. And I have that article by Morris Seidlin. It's, it's, you can find it easily in my book because it comes under Z in the index. Morris Seidlin, professor at the University of California, San Diego. He had a letter published in the Communist Daily World in regard to the United States moving too slowly towards regional government. It worked so well in the Soviet Union. So anyway, Heritage has this guy coming in from New Zealand, educating all of us on the glories of consolidation regional government. Then the latest thing uh, is uh, the Heritage Foundation's support for the community-oriented policing system. Now, Edwin Meese last September wrote a paper, it's on the internet, you can find it, supporting the community-oriented policing system, which many of us, including uh, Detective Wirtz from San Diego uh, in the year 2001, he did a 10-pager in regard to the COPS program, and it was referred to as the East German Stasi Stitch, Stitch program. So in other words, Heritage supports that too. And then um, I do want to point out that I wrote, after I got fired, um, I, after I got myself fired, that was a conscious decision that I made. You know, I, I got all, my, all the documents out of my office in 1981, all these secret documents and everything. And by the way, you know, uh, the Department of Education uh, is unconstitutional, so I had every right to steal those documents because I, I was supporting the Constitution in doing so. So anyway, um, I wrote, after I was relieved of my duties, the president, and I never heard from them. I explained everything. Uh, Becky Dunlop, who's a church, she was Becky Norton. She used to work for the, main, for the American Conservative Union, a wonderful girl. She got me to start the affiliate to the American Conservative Union in Maine in the 70s. Well, she's now high up at Heritage. Uh, she got married, and her whole philosophy switched from being a great American to uh, being whatever Heritage is. She's, she works for them. And But anyway, the reason I'm mentioning her is that she was responsible. She gave me an office in the White House uh, after I got myself fired. And she worked with me on my letter to President Reagan, explaining to him that the Marxist goings on in the Department of Ed. And very nice letter. It was about eight pages. Uh, and that letter, I never got an answer. And uh, so I contacted Ed Meese's office, and I went, finally coming back from Maine, I went down to meet with Ed Meese, I thought, but I met with Ken Cribb instead. And Ken patted me on the back and said, oh, aren't you happy that the president got your letter? And I said, uh, well, no, I have not. I, I don't. I want a response. He doesn't have to write anything more than thank you for your letter, Mrs. Zubate. Uh, sincerely, Ronald Reagan. That's all I want so I can prove to the American people that he knows everything going on in the U.S. Department of Education, that it is a Marxist factory. So I told him that, and uh, I got nowhere. And, and then um, about, what, 35 years later? <laughs> you see, really, Dan, I, it takes me a while. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, I've seen that letter, though, from, uh, 
from Reagan to Ed Meese trying to uh, yeah, saying he uh, needed to get together with you. Well, I got that 35 years later after writing the Reagan Library. And Ed Meese stopped the meeting. So I'm talking about Ed Meese, who's still in Heritage. He's been there. He's about my age. You know, he's been there since 1980, certainly. And he is still, he's very, very much involved. And I want to point out that the Heritage Foundation, whenever you get a Republican elected to the presidency, Heritage Foundation drafts all the briefing books for the different departments. Now, we had Heritage's briefing book for education, which is everything I'm talking about, which is horrible. They, they draft briefing books for labor, transportation, whatever. Every department gets a briefing book from the Heritage Foundation. That's how important they are. Mm. And, well, uh, you know, we... so I did, the, I did the Patriots or Manchurian candidate. People can, you, you can find that just by typing it into uh, your search engine. I hate to use the word Google. Your search engine. Just type in Patriots or Manchurian Candidates and my name. It's their base, but it's also at my website, DeliberateDumbingDown.com. Mm -hmm. the, the whole story is there. Uh, Dan, he saw it. He saw the photocopy of the note handwritten by Reagan to Ed, you know, saying, Dear Ed, you know, uh, maybe I should meet with this woman, you know, whatever. Talk to me after we're finished with this trip we're going on. And so um, that is, you know, so what, I, what I'm trying to say here is that Heritage Foundation and the Council for National Policy, now you really all ought to go, that's on my website, you can find it, it's called, uh, you know, the takeover of the conservative movement or something like that, hijacking, hijacking of the conservative movement. In that article, uh, I discussed pretty much what I just talked to you about now, but uh, I discussed a project that uh, Rosalind Haley, the late Rosalind Haley, wonderful woman from Texas, good friend of Ron Paul, uh, she was appointed by Reagan uh, as representative of the United Nations. Uh, this happened, uh, of course, during Reagan's administration. In the 90s, uh, I knew Roz through a mutual friend, and we all knew Norman Dodd, Ross Haley, Norman Dodd, et cetera, you know, the investigator of the Tax Exempt Foundations, all that. Um, I knew her pretty well. And I thought, you know, Joe Scorbra, who's now, you know, has the, with Brzezinski, yeah, that wretched left-wing program they have together, but Joe Scorbra from Florida uh, at one time appeared to be a real conservative, and he had a bill in Congress to get us out of the United Nations. And so I thought one day, you know, we can't get, we just can't get any coverage on anything, as all of your listeners know. Uh, the media is totally controlled. Uh, how about a postcard project? So I thought, what we can do here, we'll put the basic rotten things about how it was formed by communists, the UN, uh, various other things, the, the, the legislation that Scarborough had drafted to get us out of the UN, the number of the bill, uh, who to contact, etc. And uh, information, you know, not much. You can't get much on a postcard, but it was a, an effort to get us out of the United Nations postcard project. Now, what we wanted people to do was they could make their own postcards. It's very easy to do. Always have 100 of them in your pocket or your purse. You leave them at the hardware store, supermarkets, uh, under windshield wipers. Uh, you, you, doctors. Charlotte, uh, I, I, I hate to break, uh, but we've got a, a commercial break coming. Please hold that thought, and we'll pick it up on the other side of the break. Okay, fine. Serving the planet, the micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com. You take the blue pill. The story ends. You wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill. You stay in Wonderland. And I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes.
There was a mighty nation, blessed above all of creation. It was a rare and precious pearl. Conceived in faith and liberty, home of the brave, land of the free. It was the envy of the world. But this shining city on a hill has turned from the Creator's will and let evil take control. Now the reckless men who lead them want to strip away their freedom and to steal their very soul. Now it's smoke and mirrors, switch and bait, criticize and confiscate and let the guilty walk away. In this once righteous, godly nation, in the halls of education, they forbid a child to pray. They say we need to spread the wealth. They pretend to guard the health of the feeble and the poor, while the hand they hold behind their back confuses and conceals the fact that the wolf is at the door. There's an unseen hand. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And today, my guest on the radio show is Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet. And uh, Charlotte is uh, someone who is very, very aware and very tuned in on uh, what the education system in America is, uh, how it is being subverted to be something totally different than what our, you know, certainly our founding fathers ever intended, but also uh, what average Americans would really think would be good for this country. Uh, before we get back into the discussion, I want to uh, uh, ask our listeners, please support this radio network. Uh, we are working very hard to create a, uh, a satellite uplink that would allow uh, the Micro Effect Radio Network to be transmitting literally all over North America. And that is a project that we've been working on for some months. We need your help in getting this done. We need your financial support. Please go to the website and support in any way that you can our effort to get that satellite link up and running. And I also want to mention uh, to our listeners that we've got other terrific radio programs on this network. Uh, and I'll remind our listeners about Debbie Boscalupi's Radioactive Wednesday, which is on tomorrow at the same time as my Connecting the Dots radio show. And Debbie has got uh, some terrific guests on tomorrow to talk about smart meters and how smart meters are being used to literally control our electrical usage, uh, find out exactly what we've even got in our refrigerators and, and things like that through uh, smart appliances and smart meters. So um, please listen to her show. And uh, Jeff Bennett is on immediately after my show today, and he's on Tuesday through Friday at... Uh, um, well, it would be 11 o'clock to 1 o'clock uh, Mountain Time. And uh, his show is called uh, Life, Liberty, and All That Jazz. And Jeff, Jeff does a terrific job on that. So anyway, let's get back to the discussion about education in America. Uh, Charlotte, one thing that uh, you, you've alluded to, but we need to really make an emphasis on this, is the U.N., and the Council on Foreign Relations, which is basically the group that's been promoting uh, world government for the last 80 years, 90 years, um, the, uh, <clears throat> the Council on Foreign Relations and the Heritage Foundation have an awful lot of interchangeable players. And we've got to understand that we really do have a shadow government in this country that is promoting a lot of ideas that are not in the best interests of us as a constitutional republic. And they have targeted for a very long time the, 
education of our youth. And I know you mentioned Norman Dodd. Uh, there was a, a group called the Reese Commission, uh, and I believe he was a senator from Kansas uh, who no, 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 no. in Ron, the 1950s. Dodd. I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no he was not. Norman Dodd? Uh, he was no, no, uh, 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 Reese. Bank. And yeah. he was uh, Andover Prep School and Yale, I think. And uh, no, he was he came, he was pulled down to be the research director for the uh, uh, investigation of the tax exempt foundations in nineteen. Right, and that was called the Reese Commission. That was a, yeah, that's, that's I right. believe, a senator from Kansas who was uh, uh, given that commission in the, and, and I believe it was part of the. House Un-American Activities Committee yes, that right. uh, initiated that action, right? Well, the, people can go and watch that marvelous uh, the uh, conversation. It's all over the world. It's on the internet. Uh, that Ed Griffin, your uh, Edward Griffin, who's on the Revelation movie too, um, Ed Griffin gave Norman Dodd uh, in regard to the uh, investigation of, of the. Foundation, a lot of, inf I mean, it's an unbelievable, very, very fine interview that, mm -hmm. that Griffin did there. Uh, I knew Norman Dodd pretty well. And anyway, uh, getting back to uh, Rosalind Haley, of course, she knew Norman Dodd well, too. So I was talking about Ros Haley from Texas, and uh, she was the grand dame of the, the uh, Council for National Policy. And I have an article entitled, uh, what's it called, uh, Hijacking of the Conservative Movement. That is at my website, if you look under articles. And in that article, uh, you will see the story where, and I think I talked about the postcard project, right? So what we did was, uh, to carry it out, my son Sam, the one that they attempted to murder twice, He's still alive and a bit damaged. Uh, he's the one who he, he got all the names of the members of the Council for National Policy off the Internet. We had big brown envelopes. We stuffed them with all the information about Russian and German uh, military movements in our country with, you know, tanks and trucks and all, you know, exercises. And everything else going on that Russ and I could think of that was just horrible. And we felt that... Uh, the Council for National Policy would, of course, with about 300 people involved uh, and Heritage, would would help us with this postcard project, which I mentioned before the break. Well, okay, so of course we I didn't sign the letter. Roz wrote it, and she's the grand dumb. Everybody loves her. Roz Kelly's the great, greatest woman in the world, greatest conservative, and she was. She's one of us, and you're listening to her. So Roz signs the letter. They were asking for help. We did. We got one response out of 300 or so brown packets sent out asking for help in in getting Joe Scarborough legislation to get out of the UN to get them on board, helping to get this bill to get out of the UN passed. Our postcard project. We got one response. That's got to tell you something about the Council for National yeah. Policy and heritage. Roz was devastated because, you know, she had been a member for many years of these groups. And uh, I, of course, was not too surprised because after Reagan allowed the signing of the agreement with Gorbachev and Carnegie with the Soviet Academy of Science and all, and, and Phyllis Schlafly telling me that when I asked her, I said, look, Phyllis, can't you do anything about Carnegie signing, you know, doing this agreement with the Soviet Academy of Science? She says, oh, I can't go there. And I said, well, do I have to? She said, well, if you want to. You know, so this is real to me. I don't know. There's a word for that. I'm not going to use it. But anyway, so that was our postcard project that went down the tube. It shows there, right there, the uh, the wonderful Americans out there who have been writing checks to all the different groups, whether, you know, there are a lot of them. You know, I can't list all of them. You don't have enough time. I've talked until 10 o'clock tonight. But uh, these groups have not been, 
that you've been funding are the right. Trojan horse. Right. Uh, so anyway, that's the Haley story. Now, this uh, this real dynamite one. Now, you can just type in is there a beat letter to Schlafly. Probably type, uh, just, it's on my website, too. Uh, the whole thing is there. And uh, it's about a, you know, five or six-page letter asking Phyllis in 1995 to please help her eagles in all states uh, stop the charter school movement. And I explained everything to her about what they are. They are necessary, because you certainly aren't going to get parents, normal parents, to approve of putting the Soviet Polytech workforce training system in. I don't think so. I think they want academics, not workforce training for their children. Uh, anyway, they are the vehicle, charter schools, to implement the Soviet workforce polytech system. So I, I wrote her, and I explained all this, and uh, then I attached to that letter, we found out of the state of Washington, that is also on the Internet. I sent it through to you, I think, this morning. Uh, we found letters written to the people involved in putting in the charter school choice thing in the state of Washington in 1995, uh, that group, I don't know what it was called, Education Excellence Coalition with uh, Jim Spady and Fawn Spady, they were setting that up for charter schools. And a attached to my letter to Phyllis warning her were about 10 letters from people we have all heard of, like uh, Empower America, uh, William Bennett, Secretary of Education. Lamar Alexander, Gene Allen from the Heritage Foundation. Uh, you can go on all the libertarian groups. Uh, Bill Baldwin, Washington Institute for Policy Studies. Look at the sidebar of the letterheads. Uh, you're going to be absolutely appalled. Here are the co-directors. These people that I'm mentioning, the conservatives, were all supporting this move in the state of Washington, led by Fawn and Jim Spady, supported by, I hope you're sitting down, the National Education Association. Yeah. And so any time you hear their out. name in, in a use like that, you know that it's not uh, for the betterment of the, uh, the education system. Well, what on earth are all these so-called... Conservatives, Alexander Bennett, Jack Kemp, Gene Kirkpatrick, Ben Weber, the chairman of the group that was supporting it out of Empower America, Malcolm Forbes, the directors, these are the ones who are all supporting the NEA project for school choice and charters. How many people know the NEA supports school choice and charters? How many people yeah. know that at the top of the NEA's old cardinal principles paper that I have. It's in my book. Uh, you have the pre-planning committee for the NEA's agenda for this century. And at the top, you have the leading guy is David Rockefeller and McGeorge Bundy, who are in charge of the NEA. At the top, these are the top people. Mm -hmm. They have the other ones like Theodore Sizer and all the other rotten change agents do. All the other commies, huh? But anyway, so the directors of this, you know, Empower America group, uh, Newt Gingrich, Lawrence Kudlow, you know, Larry Kudlow, Senator Trent Lott, Michael Novak, Dennis Prager, Donald Rumsfeld, huh? How about him? Uh, honestly, supporting letters came from Alexander Bennett, Gene Allen, who was with Heritage Foundation, at that time president, Center for Education Reform, Grover Norquist. Now, I'm, I'm just going to look. That is like a roll of toilet paper. It really is. Excuse me. I, that's a good, good definition for it, huh? Uh, <laughs> of conservative treason. 
that my letter to Phyllis Schlafly, warning her about it, enclosing all the documents, all those things I've just been talking about. Now, I don't know. I never got a response from Phyllis. I know Phyllis very well, too, extremely. And, and there's so much good about Phyllis. And prior to her getting involved in education, she was fantastic. You know, she was writing Kissed Her on the Couch. She was all up on the soul, pity, she, everything. And I know her personally. So it's very hard for me to speak this way. You know, I really, I often wonder, I, I'm going to give her the benefit of the doubt, did she ever see that letter? I never got a response. Mm-hmm. But she knows that it went out, that, that I got it out on the Internet. And had she not been involved, you know, she could have called me and said, Charlotte, I never saw that letter you wrote me. But she didn't. And so, you know, you talk about wanting to cry. I tell you, I got a lot of tears that I shed every day. Now, let's get around to those those organizations like CFR, Bilderberger, and all that. Now, as many of your listeners know, I, I'm sorry. I happen to have relatives who were members of the Order of Skull and Bones at Yale. Hmm? Well, um, I, I never knew all, uh, I didn't know all the names until my dad was dying in New Jersey, and I was down there taking care of him. And Sam was with me, too. And one day, the postman brings this box for Dad, but I was taking, he was about to die. So I'm taking care of it. So I open it up, and there's the two black catalogs. Uh, of the ne- membership of the orders, they'd never done it before. I-, I remember taking them into my father, and I said, Dad, I don't know what this is. You know, he said, but they never did that before. You know, well, interestingly enough, the same day, Tony Sutton, you know, Anthony Sutton, who-, who wrote all the wonderful books, Wall Street and Bolshevik Revolution and everything else, he always said his best book was How the Order Controls Education. You can get that book. It's a little book. It's at my son's website, American Deception, but it's also, believe it or not, you can type it into the Internet, into Google, and it'll pop up and you could read it. But Tony told, told me that. Now, so this conversation I'm having with him, the same day the postman brings those books, Sutton calls me, and he says, Charlotte, you know, we used to talk a lot about Soviet affairs because I worked in Soviet affairs, too, in the State Department, and I've always been interested in that. And uh, he said... I just, I don't understand. I just cannot locate the nexus of this. Where is this coming from? And he said, the only, do you know anything about the order at Yale? And I said, well, yes, <laughs> I do. Uh, my father and grandfather were members. And he said, they were? And I said, yes, and it's really weird you should call me today because I just received the two books with all the membership and the whole biographic info under each one of their names. And so he said, would you mind lending them to me? And he said, I know that's sort of, you know, family thing, and you you have every right to say no. And I said, well, no, I will lend them to you. And so I did, and he got them back to me, and he called me, and he said, that's it. He said, I finally have the answer. It's the order at Yale. And none of us have ever really been able to, uh, you know, absolutely 100% point the finger and say they are the ones who give the orders to the others, right? The other groups, all you need is have one member of the order in it, huh? And he gives the orders. And there's a very interesting quote on the back of one, one of Tony's books. I, uh, I don't think it's there anymore. You have to have an original. I think it's the one that he talks about, uh, you know, the establishment or whatever it is, his major book. Mm-hmm. And it says there, uh, there's a little note, and it says uh, in regard to uh, one of the members of the order that Dad knew, it's a comment. And this individual was writing an older member of the order. You know, he was probably member of the order was kind of dead, 
Uh, he was writing a letter. This was during the House Committee on the Investigation of Communism. Remember, you were just talking about it on American Affairs. Right, right. And this quote was written to an older member of the order saying, you know, as long as we have a member from Bones there, there should be no problem. Did you hear me? Mm-hmm. Isn't that amazing? Yes, it is. And uh, it is very amazing. You know, so I don't know. I mean, I wrote a chapter in the other book by Chris Milligan, which is really super book. Chris knew Anthony Sutton very well. They're very close. In fact, it, Chris, Chris got it published in all of Sutton's books. But uh, Chris, uh, Chris Milligan, who was I going to say about Oh, Chris, he wrote the book called Fleshing Out Skull and Bones. It's a wonderful book, and it is a free PDF on the Internet. And he asked me to do a chapter, which I did. It's sort of uh, the order from the viewpoint of a daughter. And I did a lot of work on that article. It actually was pretty good, and I, I most of the stuff I got from Dad's things and books, and et cetera. And it was interesting. It was at Amazon. I, there was a... Uh, I'm not patting myself on the back here, Dan. I'll tell you something. I could have a lot of patting on the back, and I still wouldn't recover from what I've looked at over the past 40 years. <laughs> but anyway, uh, there was a guy in England who read that book, and he said... The best chapter is the one by the daughter, was my chapter. Mm. And that's in Fleshing uh, Skull and Bones, Chris Milligan's mm-hmm. book. And I really have a lot of stuff in there. I was reading it the other day myself, and I thought, hmm, uh, all about, uh, you know, the president of Columbia and my, him under, knowing my grandfather and giving him the mining award number one miner that ever went through Columbia School of Mines, and, and how did he get out to South Africa, you know, Butler, the head of Columbia, and all the other connections, and the British connections, and he ends up out there. I'm not proud of this, folks, opening up the gold mines, and then Joan Vian picks up the whole thing on, on the revelation thing, and I'm, I'm, re- I'm getting about sick to my stomach. She's talking about how the very people my grandfather was in charge of the mining people well i mean i i and then my, so sam came in and said what's wrong with you i said I, I think i'm going to throw up i said how i mean how is it possible that my family could have been so involved in the new world order through mining mm-hmm. in south africa well you know uh, charlotte you know, uh, one I, one I, of the I things said, that no, it's not your fault well should Charlotte, one of the things that comes out of all this discussion is the fact that there are an awful lot of what you would think very, very good people, very well-intended people, and they get co-opted by the entire process, and they end up doing things that are totally uh, the opposite of, I think, what they really intend to do. And they just flat don't realize the, the connections, the tentacles, that are, uh, let's say, dragging them in the wrong direction. Well, yeah, I think you're right. And you have to take into consideration the period in history, always. And uh, at that time, of course, that was, you know, the late 1800s, the Boer War and all that stuff and stuff. Right, right. And uh, I don't think my grandfather from Pottsville, Pennsylvania, mining, uh, I I don't, he he wasn't able to look ahead, or or I, I don't think so, but he was involved with uh, Cecil Rhodes and uh, you know Sir Ray Bailey and all these all these people. And my dad, uh, although he's very young, he was born in 1903, but they didn't leave until 1914 when World War One broke out. And uh, Dad always ha- detested the British, and he would talk about the Boer War a lot. He gave me a little book called Commando by a young 16-year-old Boer, Dutch boy who went up against the uh, Brits, huh? And uh, my father had to go to a horrible prep school and when they went back in 1914. They went, spent two years in London and then came back to the States. And, uh, but when he was, uh, you know, in London, uh, he had to go to that horrible prep school. And 
he hated everything about it. And my father really, uh, you know, I, I shouldn't be speaking so badly about Great Britain. I'm going to probably get a bomb on the house. But uh, he detested the prince. He hated it because he, he saw so much. He was, he was young. He was, what, mm-hmm. three? He was born in 93, left in 14. He was 11 years old when he left. But he had been watching this. And I guess picked up a lot of it. So, but anyway, so it gets over. And then he then he goes and he goes to Yale and he gets tapped because his father had been. Dad never had anything to do with anything serious to do, do with the order. Uh, he did go to one of the Bohemian Grove things, and I got a letter from him. He wrote to mom, and he just said it was the most disgusting, horrible thing with excellent food and entertainment and everything. But he would never go back. So my dad, he was a mayor wow. of several towns. He was an Episcopalian. Uh, you know, I'm very biased towards my father. I, I will always adore him. And at the end, though, before he died, he looked at me, and he heard me talking to Phyllis a lot on the phone, too, because she was putting together, you know, child abuse in the classroom. She was going to start selling it at the Republican convention that year. And uh, we talked all the time, Phyllis and I, about all these horrible values that's going programs. And uh, Dad heard that. He was, we, we had a little room for, for him off the kitchen. And then he heard my talking to Sutton, too. And so at the end, you know, he looked up and he, he said, Sharp, if I had more time, I'd help you. Yep. Wow. Yeah, so, that's, you know, that's, that's really... Uh, now, let your audience in, because I've talked enough, and I think I've pretty much covered... Everything they've got to know that everything that pretty much that I've talked about is is documented, and it's on my mm-hmm. website. And um, I'm sorry, I hate you know, but uh, am I meant to keep my mouth shut about this? No, it's too late. I mean, well, you can't, anyway. you can't, uh, Charlotte, and that's one of the things that we, you know, we have to as watchmen on the wall. We need to make sure that America understands that so many of the things that we really grew up believing in, uh, that so many of these things have been manipulated and changed in a way that they're the opposite of what we ever really believe. And certainly some of these conservative organizations are a perfect example of that. And, you know, the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, I mean, oh my good grief, they can't, they can't do enough to promote oh. uh, trade with communist countries and all the other things that are going on. Well, their agenda is in my deliberate dumbing down, and it comes, Erica yep. Carl was one of our great researchers. We had these great people, you know, I could name all of them prior. I've got a Patriot list on my, on that website, a Patriot list. Well, Erica Carl did something on the Chamber of Commerce. You should see. Recently, Charlotte, we've got, I, 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 I hate to break US again, US but we've government. got another break. But uh, let's pick this up on the other side. And okay. uh, let's see if some of our callers will call in, 208-935-0094, and ask questions. Thank you so much for listening to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. Dan will be back shortly. In the meantime, Dan wanted me to speak to you about connecting your own dots when it comes to being prepared for any situation. As we have all observed in the news, natural disasters are occurring at a record pace across the United States and the world. Hurricanes and floods, earthquakes and wildfires burning out of control. You could potentially have a bullseye on your own town or country. For that reason, Dan has partnered with Patriot Prepared to bring you a full line of products to provide the insurance that you need for any unexpected disaster. Whether it's our full line of high-quality, freeze-dried, storable food, our own industry-leading water filtration products, you can find it all by visiting PatriotPrepared.com forward slash dots. It makes good sense to be prepared. That's PatriotPrepared.com forward slash dots. Now you can feel that squeaky clean sensation like none other with Vitamer Toothpaste and Mouthwash. Vitamer Toothpaste and Mouthwash is a unique natural formula not found in any other oral care products. 
With a gentle combination of zinc, folic acid, myrrh, and clove oil, Vitamer effectively whitens teeth, removes plaque, and freshens breath, and it does it naturally without any harmful chemicals. Visit us online at Vitamer.com. That's V-I-T-A-M-Y-R.com. Or call us today to place your order at 1-888-558-8482. That's 1-888-558-8482. Keep your teeth and gums healthy with Vitamer toothpaste and mouthwash. Vitamer, nature's answer to healthy teeth and gums. And remember, it's all completely natural. Available at participating health food stores nationwide. Olive's Auto Parts, 1135 Michigan Avenue in Orofino. Olive's Guns and Ammunition, Gunsmithing, Accessories, Scopes by Night Force, New and Used. Olive's Chainsaw, Sales and Service. That's Olive's Auto Parts at 800-592-6832. That once again, 800-592-6832. Serving the planet, the micro effect. www.themicroeffect.com I really understand sometimes what a terrible burden it is to know some of the things that I know. And try to wake people up and impart this knowledge to them. And find out that they just have walls built in front of them. They want to be slaves. Now I risk sounding like a conspiracy theorist. But it's no longer a theory. What I'm about to say is fact. The secret organizations of the world power elite are no longer secret. They have planned and are now leading us into a one world communist government. Well, welcome back to Connecting the Dots with Dan Happel. And today I have Charlotte Thompson Iserbeet as our guest on the show. And we've been talking about education in America and the transformation. Uh, is uh, President Obama would have said uh, the fundamental transformation of America through our education system certainly is one of those aspects. Uh, before we get back into the discussion, though, I, I want to remind our listeners, please support this network. Please support our sponsors on this network. And so please support the programming that we have on this network. Uh, uh, Debbie Boscalupi's Radioactive Wednesday will be uh, coming up tomorrow morning at the same time as my show on Tuesdays, only it's on Wednesday. And uh, she does a terrific job as well. Also, uh, Life, Liberty, All That Jazz is something coming up right after my show, and that is uh, Jeff Bennett, and he does a terrific job as well. We've got some really, really good programming on this network, but we cannot survive and grow without your support. So please uh, support this network and support the sponsors who are providing advertising for this network. So, um, and incidentally, uh, Joe, uh, cut in if we do have uh, someone on our uh, call in line, and that's 208-935-0094. Uh, I think, Charlotte, you would like to have uh, folks calling in and asking questions if they have questions about uh, some of the things that you've been talking about. You do so, have a caller. Uh, I'm sorry? You do have a caller. Okay, good. Uh, uh, caller, um, you're online, and uh, please ask your question uh, for Charlotte, and I'm sure she'd be more than happy to answer. Yeah, thanks for having me. You've already mentioned, Charlotte, the Heritage Foundation as being a conservative, so-called conservative group to watch out for. What other conservative groups, so-called conservative groups, and and conservative maybe uh, conferences should we should we be careful of? And I'll take the answer offline. Thank you. Oh, okay. Well, yes. There's a conference coming up next January uh, that uh, actually Donna Hearn in in the in in St. Louis. Uh, she had she's heading up 
the new branch of Eagle Forum, sort of. And uh, I would be, I saw that, um, blew me away last week. I thought, these are the people that have allowed what I've been talking about today to happen. And, and really, they've got a lot of uh, people listed there who are speakers and all that. I'm sorry, I just, I have to warn people not to go to that. That's not very nice of me to do that. I hate to do it because, but I, I have to. It's, it's in early January, and it's, um, I think it's called Educational Leadership Conference or something, and, and it's Donna Hearn from Missouri who is sort of taking the place of Phyllis Schlafly. And um, I'm not happy about that either because, you know, there was that break in, in the Eagle Forum, and uh, I certainly supported Phyllis's side, and her daughter was a real traitor. And so you have to really check Eagle Forum out very carefully. And uh, the conference that's coming up in January is certainly something I would be very careful about not attending and telling people not to attend. Okay, and any time you hear the... Uh the the terms advancement or uh, improvements or changes in education uh, almost always those are warning flags that uh, uh, something is going to be selling and promoting uh, socialism or certainly collectivism uh, well, and a different way of thinking in education isn't that right yeah, Charlotte let me say something here because uh, my my, I got on my white horse mainly, well, to the change in trading, but we received a, grant, a uh, document from Berkeley. It was called the Berkeley Model, Health Education in, 1980, in 1978. Huh? And that got me, I started Guardians of Education because of that. Now, I don't want to go on long on this thing. It was mostly, a, it, look, we think in terms of education as ABCs and all. No, it's not. It's in the, Zero. It's brainwashing for world government. That's what it is. This health education curriculum was mainly about the UN, and there was one requirement for 11th graders, at least, in there that blew my mind. And now I want people to listen to this because we're all wondering why the world has absolutely sunk into a satanic operation in regard to sex. We can't understand how it could be so horrible. Well, I'll tell you why. I found an objective in the health education, state health education for Maine in 1978 for 11th graders, it would be first grade now, for the students to understand the three types of sexual intercourse, including with animals. Wow. And that was right in their publication? Yes, I saw that. That was one of the, the, the standards. Forget standards. The minute you see the word standards, you say, no, I'm not going there. Nobody has a right to have standards for my local mm -hmm. school. Our teachers and parents can develop that together with hopefully a good superintendent. But that was a standard that was meant to be met in Maine. And we, Guardians of Education for Maine, we got so upset, you know what we did. I had the Maine Conservative Union at the time that I'd founded, and it was really moving fast and doing well. Well, the head of the Guardian, head of the Maine Conservative Union member and myself, we decided that we were going to do something very illegal, not according to Robert's rules, and we were going to change the Maine Conservative Union into uh, Guardians of Education for Maine, because when we saw this one standard and all the other bad ones in the health ed, we said, this is it. And we managed to get the guys to go along with us against Robert's rules and everything. And so my main conservative union merged into Guardians of Education for Maine. And when people hear the word education, as you said, it has nothing to do with education. It has to do with changing your children's Christian attitudes, values, and beliefs, and yeah. even attitudes, values, and beliefs of some families that are agnostic, they don't believe in this horror story facing us today. But, I mean, that is unbelievable. When I saw that, I thought, huh? And I went to the Commissioner of Education in the late 90s with that curriculum and with all the other horrible curriculum I brought out of the department. I went to the Commissioner in Maine, 
And I showed him that. And what I showed him was a project coming out of Kansas and Nebraska, funded by my office, and Shirley McHugh was involved, major change agent, and it was it was it was a horrible project uh, to go out across the country, and uh, one page said from, one column, one column had from and to, to huh? and it started with uh, from representative government to participatory democracy, and then it, mm. this, this is what the, you see this is the political end of education. Then it had, I'm not, there are about 15 horrible things on that list, but it went from male versus female to androgynous. And so I showed that to the commissioner. He's about my age, really, I guess, at that time. And he looked at me and he said, Charlotte, what's androgyny? And I said, oh, Leo, that's, you're like, more like I am and you're more like me. And he said, what? And I said, listen, you have all these documents I've just given you. He's our commissioner. On what I brought out of the Department of Ed, you would be the most famous person in the United States of America if you would take a stand against the restructuring of American education. Well, he, he, he didn't do that, but he did. A, a few days later, I received a huge box full of all the documents in Maine what they were putting in. That was his way of saying, thank you, but I can't take a stand. But that is a true story. Mm -hmm. Well, and I think, uh, surely a lot of people around the country, and I've, I, I know some of the uh, school teachers, the educators, the people that are involved in our education system, they have good intentions, but they are so... I, I, because of the teachers' colleges, because of uh, so many changes in our education system over the last 60 to 80 years, uh, they on on uh, all these collectivist programs, and they do it like second nature anymore, and they they just don't realize what they're doing. Well, I have to say this: up until say 20 years ago. Uh, public school teachers. I, got, I started out being really angry with them because I was on this local school board and I thought they were all, you know, they were all bad. And but through, through the years and teachers, I'll, I'll tell you one thing, I've had more calls from public school teachers about the torture, what they have to go through with in-service training, all of this horror story that they live with every day. They have to do the right thing behind closed doors, etc. I have had so many calls from these. These are great American teachers. They, there's still some. They don't want to use the Skinner direct instruction right. workforce right. training method necessary for school to work. Why would any teacher want to train a child like an animal rather than to teach them like a human being? They right. hate the method. They hate computers. And I have to say that. There are still, I would say, not many, maybe 25% of our public school teachers, maybe that's a little high, uh, are still left. They have to be over 40, probably 45. They're mm -hmm. like this wonderful Jane Aiken from New Hampshire, who actually started the Tea Party up there the, when it was a real good one. Jane Aiken, 35 years in the trenches behind closed doors. There's a video of her on our exposing the global road to ruin through education, which also was boycotted by the neoconservatives. That marvelous video said it's free on YouTube. It's free. You can hear, you can type her name in, A I T K E N, Jane Aitken. And you could see her presentation at one of those conferences in regard to what she went through as a public school teacher trying to do the right thing. Right, right. That happens all the time, Charlotte. They uh, they take the good people and they isolate them. Of course, you know you mentioned this. Uh, uh, that's one of the training methods they do is that they separate the good people and then they kind of yeah. demonize or certainly put down their point of view, and eventually they shut up all the dissension, all the people that uh, want to stand up and do the right thing. You know, what you just said is so important because I was going to talk about that, but I've forgotten. 
Uh, because I, you know, you become so involved locally, like in the state of Maine. I live here, and all hell broke loose here. And I love my son was double murders or attempts and all that. I feel, oh, you know, well, I can't believe it could be anywhere else. But you, listen, it, I think it is everywhere else. I'm scared to death that it is. And the thing is, what was happened here, which you were just talking about, the isolation of the people who really believe in God, believe in the family, believe in the Constitution, love our country, uh, those people had to, have to be isolated. Now, I'm talking about Maine. I know it happened here. Then I was thinking yesterday, I'm a little slow, huh? Hmm? I thought, well, you know what? I bet that has happened in every single state. Heritage has an affiliate in every state. It may have a different name, but it's Heritage. So why would it just happen in Maine? Right. It happens everywhere. It happens every state literally it's everywhere. Up. It's like a disease. Every state must have it. So you've got listeners there who probably were feeling alone. No. I think it's every state, and that is why there may still be hope. If, if someone like yourself or any of these other talk show guys, not very many left, but if they can identify this small minority in each state that understands what I talked about today, the biggest enemy is always the one that's hidden. I mean, sure. Oh, absolutely. We, we want, you know, yeah. look at, look, I mean, the, we, we all, the left, communism, we're all, we're all opposed to communism, fascism. Oh, it's not that we don't know how evil, and we know the history of it. We know the banker history. We know everything with Federal Reserve. But we never really are looking. It's sort of like Sherlock Holmes, you know. They're, they're running, all the guys, the police are running all over London looking for the murderer. And Sherlock Holmes is sitting there with the guy in his office who, who's uh, whatever. He's the murderer. Everybody's looking everywhere else for the murderer. Mm -hmm. He's sitting right in the office with Sherlock Holmes. Yeah. No, that's, that's exactly right, and that's one way they do it is to uh, confuse and to create such a, a level of chaos and such a level of, uh, let's say, in, 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 in incredulity that people are yeah. looking for something and they don't know where to find it. Exactly. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, it's so well said, and... Uh... But, I, you know, you just really mentioning that on your part is, is important because if there is that little nucleus, you know, and I think there must be. I know not very many of us here in Maine. Maybe, well, Dottie La Fortune is fantastic. She has a blog. Then you've got Steve Schran, the former, you know, musician, former public school teacher, myself, and a few others, right? Well, we're Maine. We're small, so we wouldn't expect to have a whole lot, but... Nobody else. All the other so-called conservatives were were co-opted by the Heritage Foundation for me. Now I'm sure. I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but it makes sort of sense. Why would it just be made? No, it's not. You know that it's a national movement. Yep. Well, you've been mighty nice to let me mouth off like this. I, I'm sorry that I haven't had more calls. I, I very much appreciate that call came in, in regard to uh, what to watch out for, you know, what conferences to be careful of. I mean, look, people can always call me if they want. Mm -hmm. You know, they can find my number. And they can call me through you or whatever. And I'm always willing to help out, or they can email me. And, uh, you know, if they have a question like that, it's a very good question of hers. Uh, what to watch out for? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I I hope I can help them. I don't know everything by any means, but I've been around a long time. I mean, if yeah. I didn't know what yeah. I know by now, I'd have to be, you know, sort of 90 IQ. <laughs> <laughs> well, Charlotte, one of the things that nobody would accuse you of is being a 90 IQ. Um, I, you know, I, I, I guess what I would like to ask you is uh, your, from your perspective, what would be the best way to fight uh, this takeover of our schools? And I, I know there's a lot of people out there that would have kind of a canned answer, but I expect uh, your answer would be targeted really to dealing with, uh, dealing with school boards and making sure yeah. 
that we don't yeah. have these programs go in place that don't allow elected school boards. Well, you have to deal with the present system, which is so horrible that people don't really understand. That's how the uh, the neoconservatives managed to get their foot in the door. It's so horrible that who would ever want to put their child in the public school system anymore? And uh, But the charter schools will be no different, see? because they take the federal money, so they're going to have to put the same curriculum in. And the charter schools are essential for the Soviet Polytech workforce training system. Now, charter schools are all over the world, folks. They're not just here. In Russia, they're called, they're called contract schools. So what you have there is charter schools which, uh, without elected boards that the parents think are going to be okay because they don't seem to realize that anything that takes tax money, like a charter school does, same as the public school, uh, has to conform. And I have the legislation passed in, I think it was the 60s, it's on, it's on the website, uh, which uh, it came under uh, daycare standards uh, funding, and it says right there that any entity uh, that receives uh, tax money uh, and takes care of children during a 12-hour period or whatever, uh, has to conform its curriculum, its standards, its uh, what puts on the walls, what the children eat, to federal standards. There it is in the law. We have that. And so what you're looking at is... Two bad things. You're looking at the present public school system and the charter school one. But the worst one is the charter school one because it doesn't have any way for a parent to go in and say, hey, what is this three types of sexual intercourse, including with animals? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You can't go in in a charter school and complain, whereas you still can in the public school. So what you suggested, Dan, it's very, very important. Uh, we have to, uh, it's impossible, it's really almost an impossibility, but with the grace of God, maybe we can do it. It's uh, work, try to work within the system, which is unfortunately now charter schools mostly. Look at the number of charter schools all over the country now. Yeah. Uh, but yeah. if you have a public school, uh, try to get to know the teachers, feel it out, go to some school board member meetings, go to definitely go to school board meetings, go with somebody else always, and be very, very polite. And uh, just say you appreciate the problems they've got and all you'd like to be, you'd like to be on a curriculum committee. Mm -hmm. They still have them, I think. And, uh, you know, you, you are not in favor of charter schools. You might just let them know that. Mm -hmm. You want the teachers to be able to teach. You want to hire good teachers. You want to have a new, they really want to have a new system where they, you know, with hiring, they, they don't have any uh, requirements, you know, on, on the forum. That, you know, that you, you can't even ask them what, what their lifestyle is or anything. You know, you, you're not allowed to. That should be changed. I mean, no, Absolutely. No corporation or anything else just takes people on without asking them something about their personal life. Hmm? But I think that, you see, we are at that point. And uh, I never dreamed, of, you know, after writing the big book and doing everything I did and being that upset as a local school board member that I would be, uh, you know, 30 years later or whatever it is, 40, uh, saying what I'm saying on the air today, I didn't know that this was going to happen. Although, as I said, in 1945, the Chamber of Commerce called for this, called for vouchers. Right, right. And it called for regional government. And it calls for everything in the U.N. It call, I mean, that's in my deliberate dumbing down. Uh, people can go look in the index under Carl, Erica Carl, C-A-R-L-E. That is the agenda of the Chamber of Commerce. And you're going to, your mind will be blown. And that is exactly what we're looking at with the public-private partnerships now. Mm -hmm. It's the government. Yeah, those, those the terms are straight out of the U.N. They really are. Uh, we've talked about that on previous shows, how non-governmental organizations and tax-exempt foundations yep. have really been uh, utilized to change our entire exactly. 
culture and our certainly our constitutional republic uh, from a republic into a democracy uh, with the ultimate goal of uh, destroying our constitutional republic. Well, the uh, you know I served as a liaison with the White House Private Sector Initiative. I was the liaison out of the department, and when they started talking about uh, public-private partnerships, because that's what it was all about, huh? I said, "What are you?" I said, "I'm not highly educated, but isn't that corporate fascism?" And they said, <laughs> yeah, "Oh, we bingo. don't know that anybody ever." Well, that is that's what we're looking at. They had to have that because of charter schools, right? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Well, uh, you know, so uh, that, sure. Yep. Charlotte, that one of it. the things that we haven't talked about, but maybe I'd like to get your your input because we're getting toward the end of the show here. Uh, no, don't no, you no, think that maybe uh, a whole lot of people should uh, consider homeschooling their children oh, yeah. because okay, uh, well, there have, are curriculums available yeah. that they could homeschool? Well, I have often, I have a list of really good stuff. And uh, I'll send it to you, Dan. Uh, I get questions all the time. You know, I have a really good, marvelous Saxon math. Not Saxon math, I'm sorry. It's a professor at Columbia whose name I can't remember, 1932. 1932, he was considered the number one math professor in the country. And these books are fantastic, fantastic. Mm. Then I've got, you know, Quest of a Hemisphere by, what's her name, Boyle. And, uh, of course, Sam Blumenfeld's incredible Alpha Phonics. And uh, something else, a few other things, too. And I, uh, the math curriculum uh, was being used down in Louisiana because parents, read, you know, they got my, my list of stuff. And they bought so many of those old books. There's still the old books available. They're, you know, uh, that uh, the book, was a, one of the math books, it goes K through 8, uh, was selling for $200. Well, wow. my Sam, what he said he wants to do, if he ever really has the energy to get back after this mess he went through, he says he wants to uh, scan all of them and put them on American Deception. Yeah, absolutely, they should do that. that he he should do done. that. Um, and, Charlotte, and I, I hear the music going, and that means that we're running out of time. Yep. We're at the end of the show. Uh, would you give uh, our listeners your website again so that they can... Tune in okay, to your uh, website uh, and, and read more about you. Deliberate dumbing down, three words, deliberate, D-U-M-B-I-N-G, down, D-O-W-N, dot com. And okay. if you go to that website, uh, everything is there that I've talked about today and a lot of stuff I haven't talked about. All the right. is well, there. We appreciate having you on, and we appreciate having our listeners. And thank you, Charlotte, and God bless you for all you're trying to do to save America.